Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm actually humbled and a little bit intimidated by the fact that on such a pleasant uh, early summer day, so many people have chosen to listen to me rather than to be out in the sun. So you do me a great honor, and I'm conscious of that. I would normally be standing, but I'm afraid that I tore my Achilles tendon uh, a month ago. So uh, you, my talk, if I were standing, would be uh, interrupted by cries of pain uh, now and again. So uh, I'm going to give my talk sitting. Uh, the, the talk is uh, in two parts, uh, although they're closely related. Uh, one is a recapitulation of the argument about zones of refuge and flight from the state uh, in a book called The Art of Not Being Governed, An Anarchist History of Upland Southeast Asia. And it occurred to me, uh, after writing the book, that there was another book to be written, which I have not written and don't intend to write, but I will talk about. And that is, I was talking mostly about mountains as a refuge for people who were running away from states. And it was pointed out to me that the other places to which people run away uh, are often what I call wet zomias. That is to say, marshes, swamps, mangrove coasts, uh, and so on. And so the last part of my talk will be devoted to wet zomias as opposed to dry zomias. Um, I want to uh, frame my talk with the last phrases of Pierre Clastre, my the hero for that book, a uh, great book called La Société contre l'État, and I quote him. He writes, it is said that the history of peoples who have a history is the history of class struggle. It might be said with at least as much truthfulness that the history of peoples without history is a history of their struggle against the state. Pierre Kloster was the first person to suggest, and it was a revolutionary suggestion at the time, that uh, groups in Latin America, the subject of anthropological work, the Guarani, the Yanomamo, um, uh, the Siriono, were thought of as Stone Age survivals, people who had never invented agriculture uh, and who had never left the forest, the sort of or Steinzeit uh, primitives. He understood for the first time, or suggested for the first time, and it's been corroborated by subsequent evidence, um, that rather than being Stone Age survivals, uh, these were actually ex-sedentary cultivators who took up foraging and hunting to escape the forced labor uh, and uh, of the Spanish reducciones and the diseases associated, associated with the reducciones. The term zomia, which is invented by a Dutch colleague of mine, a, uh, a geographer named Willem van Schendel, uh, the term Zomia is a new name for virtually all of the lands above roughly 250 meters in altitude, all the way, and here is a map that gives you in the red area, this is, if you like, the upland areas of Southeast Asia. It's the rough extent of Zomia. Uh, it's every, everything 250 meters and above from the central highlands of Vietnam uh, all the way uh, west to eastern India and Bangladesh. It crosses five Southeast Asian nations, Vietnam, a corner of Cambodia, most of Laos, Thailand, and, Bur and Burma, and four provinces of China, Yunnan, Guizhou, Guangxi, and parts of Sichuan. It is an expanse of 2.5 million square kilometers, containing about 100 million minority peoples, of truly bewildering uh, ethnic and linguistic complexity. It is what another historian has called a shatter zone, an area into which people who have been running away from one or another state or civilization or form of oppression accumulate over long periods of time. And for that reason, these are areas with a tremendous amount of fragmentation. 
in terms of uh, language and culture and subsistence practices. Geographically, this area could be known as the Southeast Asian Massif. Since this huge area is at the periphery of nine states and at the center of none, and since it violates the usual regional designations of Southeast Asia, East Asia, and South Asia, and since what makes it interesting is its ecological variety and its relationship to states, it is a kind of novel object of study. That is to say, it violates the usual forms of geographical uh, demarcations. I think of it uh, as a, a boy from Appalachia in the US as a transnational Appalachia. My thesis is simple, suggestive, and somewhat controversial. Zomia is the largest remaining region of the world whose peoples have not yet been fully incorporated into nation states. Its days are numbered in part because of the growing strength of nation states and the development of what I think of as distance demolishing technologies that allow the states to project their power to the periphery. Not so very long ago, however, such self-governing peoples were the great majority of mankind. Today, seen from the valley kingdoms, seen from the state centers, they are thought of as our living ancestors what we were like before we discovered wet rice cultivation, Buddhism, and civilization. On the contrary, I argue that the hill peoples are best understood as a runaway, fugitive set of communities who have over the course of 2,000 years, and the, the long period of time is essential in understanding it, been fleeing the oppressions of state-making projects in the valleys slavery, conscription, taxes, corvée labor, epidemics, and warfare. Virtually everything about these people's livelihoods and social organization and ideologies, and more controversially, even their oral culture as opposed to written culture, can be read as strategic choices designed to keep the state at arm's length their physical dispersion in rugged terrain, their mobility, their cropping practices, which I'll elaborate, their kinship structure, and their pliable ethnic identities are in part designed to avoid incorporation into states and, as Kloster described for South America, preventing states from springing up among them. The particular state that most of them have been evading has been, of course, the precocious Han Chinese state. A history of flight is embedded in many Hill people's legends. The documentary record, although it's somewhat speculative until 1500, is clear enough after that, including the frequent military campaigns against Hill peoples under the Ming and Qing dynasties, and culminating in the unprecedented uprisings in southwestern China in the mid-19th century that left millions seeking refuge. The flight both from the Burmese and Thai and even Tibetan slave raiding states historically is also amply documented. The reason why uh, the concept of Zomia represents a novel way of understanding politics and geography is that the huge literature on state making, contemporary and historical, pays virtually no attention to its reverse. That is to say, it pays no attention to the history of deliberative and reactive statelessness. So this is a history of the people who got away, if you like, and I don't think that state making can be understood apart from this. It's also what makes it something of an anarchist history. This account might also, if it were extended, bring together the history of all those peoples who were extruded by coercive state-making projects and unfree labor systems. The Roma, the Cossacks, the Inuit, the polygot tribes uh, in Latin America and in the Philippines, fugitive slave communities, so-called Maroons, the Marsh Arabs, the Song Bushmen. There is, for example, in across Africa, an area that was far more populated than you would expect it to be on the basis of its ecology and, uh, and richness of its environment, that happened to be that area that was a safe zone from 
uh, three different forms of slavery, North Atlantic slavery, um, Arab slavery, and uh, Indian Ocean slavery. The argument uh, about Zomia also reverses much of the received wisdom about primitivism. That is to say, I argue that the forms of uh, subsistence and agriculture, uh, that's fine. The systems of agriculture uh, and subsistence uh, are a secondary adaptation, not a kind of primitivism, but a secondary adaptation, as pastoralism often was historically, as a way to devise a means of subsistence that are not easily appropriated by the state. Um, finally, most uh, forms of subsistence and kinship uh, and cultural identity are taken as givens ecologically and culturally determined. In this case, however, by analyzing various forms of cultivation, particular crops, and certain social structures and physical mobility patterns for their escape value, I treat these givens as, in part, political choices, as strategic choices. It's useful to say, I think, that the um, the importance of communication and transport uh, is essential in understanding Southeast Asian geography and not just Southeast Asian geography. That is to say, what is important to understand is that water joins rather than divides people. Uh, this is, of course, the insight of Fernand Brodel in his book, The Mediterranean World, that, that places uh, across the Mediterranean were in closer contact culturally um, than they were with places that were 40 or 50 miles across rugged mountain paths inland uh, from the coast. Uh, the same is true for Southeast Asia because the Sunda Shelf is actually calmer than the Mediterranean, and for that reason, uh, communication across the Sunda Shelf uh, was extremely easy. easy. This means that a place that is 300 miles across easy water is actually closer than a place that is 40 or 50 miles across rugged mountain paths. Uh, and if you are interested in cultural integration, linguistic, religious integ integration, then you have to pay attention to this friction of distance and the ease of which uh, water transport is possible. My favorite example of this, which is, continues to surprise me, uh, although I've worked it out carefully, and it's a true assertion, uh, that in 1800, before the steamship, it was faster to go by boat from Southampton, England, to South Africa than it was to go by stagecoach from London to Edinburgh. Uh, and of course, people didn't go by stagecoach from London to Edinburgh. They took the ship around the coast. Uh, but it gives you some sense. And of course, you could take a lot more to South Africa in a ship than you could take in a stagecoach uh, from London uh, to Edinburgh. Uh, the other example of this is when the People's Liberation Army had invested Lhasa in Tibet and was running out of rice and could not extract enough rice from the Tibetans in order to feed themselves. Uh, it was important for the revolutionary government, this is 1957 or 8, uh, in order to get rice to them. How did they get rice to them? They got rice to them by uh, putting it on a ship all the way to Canton, from Canton all the way to Calcutta, and then up on the railroad past uh, what is now sort of Bangladesh uh, and so on, into Sikkim, and then 18,000 mules, camels, uh, and horses to get the rice finally into Lhasa. But, the short way was from Canton around to Calcutta by ship because of the ease of uh, shipment of that uh, kind of cargo. So in your mind, uh, I would ask you to imagine a map that's unlike any map you normally see of geography, because in most maps, a kilometer is a kilometer is a kilometer. Uh, and I think what we need are maps that measure the difficulty of a day's travel, uh, either by foot or by sailboat or a rowboat uh, and so on, uh, and that correct for what I call the friction uh, of distance. And if we had these maps, 
it would make the mountainous area of Southeast Asia much larger because it would reflect the difficulty of moving from place A to place B and the time that it took. Uh, and it would shrink uh, the distances across easy water. Uh, and then you would have a map that would be far more accurate in depicting actual contact and exchange, trade and cultural influence, and religious and linguistic uh, integration. Of course, the Malay world was always integrated across the sea, from Malacca uh, to Palembang and Jambi. The Greek city-states and islands were also, if you like, an archipelago of little islands that were joined by sea uh, uh, more than they were joined by land routes. <coughs> land routes. And of course, all the lowland civilizations in Southeast Asia uh, were uh, at the estuary generally of the larger rivers, the Irrawaddy, the Sital, the Sao Praia, the Tonle Sap Lake and the Mekong that is the site of Angkor Wat uh, and so on. Uh, that is, it's fair to say that these states stopped where the terrain became difficult uh, and therefore taxation and control became difficult. Um, and I think it is um, Bernard Brodel uh, who talks about the fact that states can't climb hills. Uh, that is, they do well when there's a flat plain, but once they're confronted with an um, uh, a, a, a obstacle of uh, 200 or 300 kilometers, the state tends to sort of lose its grasp on uh, such geographies, particularly if they're particularly uh, rugged. Um, in the case of Southeast Asia, partly because one there has to correct for the monsoon, it's also important to say that the state historically in Southeast Asia uh, was a dry season state. That is to say, in the wet season, in the monsoon, the state shrunk essentially to the palace walls because no one could move very far in the mud and, uh, and rain at the height of the monsoon. So the progress of the king and tax collection and adjudication and so on was a dry season phenomenon and the state was like an accordion. It expanded in the dry season and it contracted uh, radically in the, uh, in the wet season. The, so if, Let's imagine that you were a Jean-Baptiste Colbert and your job was to design the uh, perfect geography for a Southeast Asian state. Uh, if that was your assignment uh, and you were as clever as Colbert was, um, uh, you would want the state to be established on rich floodplain that had nutritious soil, um, and uh, it would also be uh, at the kind of area in which it was possible to maximize the number of productive agricultural laborers in the smallest space producing the largest possible surplus. So the problems of transportation, again, uh, depend on the compression of both production and population. And this is only possible on the rich floodplains uh, of these areas. And if you were going to design the agriculture for these areas, you couldn't do any better than irrigated wet rice, paddy rice. Um, uh, partly because paddy rice, actually more than almost any crop you could possibly imagine, gives you the largest number of calories for the for smallest unit uh, of land. Uh, paddy rice has other advantages uh, which will make you smile and laugh and think that I'm stupid, um, but uh, I, I want to insist on them and you'll see why. Um, that paddy rice is a cereal grain that grows above the ground. I know this is not a surprise to you. Uh, and it all gets ripe at roughly the same time. So if the tax man or the army want your rice, all they have to do is turn up when it's ripe. Or better yet, they let you harvest it, put it in the granary, and they confiscate the, um, the contents of the granary. Um, so 
pat and if they don't like you, they can burn your crops when they're dry in the field just before harvest. Uh, and you can also assess what the harvest is going to be like right along as it develops. It's good for the tax man. Uh, rice when harvested uh, and not uh, uh, and not hulled uh, stores for quite a long time. It has a, a great deal of value per unit weight and volume and can be transported considerable distances, uh, especially uh, considerable distances uh, over water. So it is actually ideal uh, and you have in um, the problem of Southeast Asia historically has been that it has had very little population vis-a-vis -vis its land resources. Uh, and the advantage of wet rice is that uh, it compresses a population in a productive area that allows it to be controlled by a state. Um, the, uh, I want first to sort of contrast hills and valleys, the valleys being the center of states and the hills being the area in which non-state people um, uh, reside. So the, va the valleys are the location of states, of social hierarchy, of taxes, of kings and permanent clergy, of large-scale warfare, wet rice cultivation, and of course, uh, what they consider to be civilization. The hills are the location in Southeast Asia of Sweden cultivation or slash and burn cultivation or shifting cultivation uh, in which land is cleared, planted for a certain amount of time on the basis of the nutrition provided by uh, the ash from a burn. Uh, and after two, three, four, five years, uh, the field is changed to a new area that has been cleared uh, and burned and so on. And one may rotate back after many years to an original plot that can be cleared again. But the point is that the fields, if you're interested in doing a cadastral survey, the fields are fugitive. They move uh, from year to year in many places and the cultivators themselves, as the fields move, are likely to relocate their village uh, as well. Um, the um, The hills are also the location of, uh, it's very rare to have a permanent state. You have states that are established from time to time, especially in intermontane valleys, uh, but they tend to be quite fragile. Um, the population is much more dispersed. The social structure is relatively more egalitarian. It's not egalitarian, but it's relatively <laughs> more egalitarian. And the hills are, descri are described uh, as extremely um, varied uh, geographically from place to place. So if you move 20 miles, you may encounter a different dialect, a different language, a different cultural identity, different textile patterns, uh, different food patterns, uh, and so on. That is to say, the isolation of different areas make it a little like New Guinea, where you get sort of radically different languages and cultures in a very short space because of the relative isolation of one group for another. It what create, creates, in a Darwinian sense, cultural speciation uh, is this kind of isolation over time. And there are, of course, no taxes for king or clergy. Um, the, so let me move then to the, uh, the version of the Jean-Baptiste Colbert uh, in, in which we imagine that a hill communities who wanted to evade the state could scrape together the money to hire Jean-Baptiste Colbert to design them an agroecology of evasion and escape from the state. So if you were this Jean-Baptiste Colbert, you would immediately uh, insist on the planting of roots and tuber crops. Potatoes, sweet potatoes, cassava, manioc, uh, and so on. Uh, my nomination for escape crop uh, championship uh, is cassava or manioc. It can be planted uh, almost anywhere. It takes very little care. Uh, 
It ripens in less than a year, but it can be, and this is the crucial thing, it can be safely left in the ground for two or three years and is perfectly good to eat. In Latin America, it's often called farina de guerra because uh, uh, guerrillas, rebels plant it at different places in the forest and can go back and harvest it when uh, uh, they wish to. Um, if the state wants your cassava, uh, it has to dig it up tuber by tuber, just the way you do. And then it has a cart full of uh, cassava tubers that are not worth a lot, that are pretty heavy, uh, and that will spoil uh, in a relatively short period uh, of time. So in that sense, I, we don't have time to talk about it, but uh, Friedrich the Great at the siege of Philipsburg noticed that the people of Philipsburg resisted the siege much longer because they were early adopters of the potato and so that after the armies finished their business people could come back and dig up dinner uh, and didn't have to sort of move on to another place and he felt that the kind of Prussian military age population could be kept in place if they planted roots uh, and tubers. Um, the, in a more general sense, Swiddening is, is extremely resistant to state appropriation. So in a typical Swidden or slash and burn cultivation situation, there are at a minimum 20 crops growing uh, in tandem. Uh, and uh, a Swidden is also a place designed to attract game as well, small game and large game. Uh, and the Swidden may actually be a place where maybe 50, 60 different cultivars uh, are grown. So if the tax man arrives at a Swidden, uh, there are only three or four things that are probably mature and can be collected uh, and gathered. So it is, if you like, a landscape that is resistant to regular appropriation uh, uh, of, a, of, a, of a single staple crop. And here in passing, I would note that all of the classical states in the world were all cereal or grain states, either millet in the Yellow River, or maize, uh, or rice, or wheat and barley for, uh, for the Middle East. Um, because of this polycropping, uh, you also have a population, as I said, the land itself that is cultivated moves, so its uh, property is very complex, and there is a common property resource management uh, among these groups. Uh, and the population itself moves. Uh, in, in this case, you, my argument is that if you have regular water and you have any sort of low play, you could build terraces, it is possible to plant wet rice up in the hills. There's no problem in doing it as long as you have a regular water supply. My argument is that swiddening, uh, and in some cases hunting and gathering and foraging, is an adaptation designed in part to keep the state at arm's length. That it is a political subsistence strategy uh, as well as a strategy that is suited to a particular ecology. Um, so from a 2,000 year perspective, I want to argue that the move to the hills is a, in response to state making projects in the valleys the flight from taxes, from conscription, also political dissent. One finds in upland Burma uh, lots of monasteries, Buddhist monasteries, that represent heterodox Buddhist sects that were kicked out of the valley and that ran away to the hills and that are preserved like an historical museum of dissident Buddhism uh, in, the Shan, uh, in the Shan Hills. Famines and disease are extremely important in the flight from the valley, partly because the crowding of domesticated animals uh, and of crops and people in these valley kingdoms produced a perfect epidemiological storm to the extent that they were far more vulnerable to epidemic zoonotic uh, infectious diseases. Uh, and therefore, uh, they, their fragility, partly because simply of the crowding and the arithmetic logic of epidemics uh, made them more, more vulnerable to these diseases. I think one of the ways in which people more familiar with European history can understand this process is to think of the Cossacks. Uh, the Cossacks were, 
originally nothing more and nothing less than serfs from European Russia who ran away from serfdom. And if they went to the Don Basin, they became known as the Don Cossacks. They went to the Azov Sea, they became the Azov Cossacks. I think they're 13 or 16 Cossack hosts, depending on where they dispersed to. And what's interesting about them is that they were, if you like, if you like, a class rabble of, uh, of, of serfs who at the frontier learned in a different ecology with open uh, common property resources, learned the horseback habits of the Tartars, uh, and became an ethnic group at the frontier. Uh, later on, of course, they provide fully, like Hesse, provided fully mobilized military units for the Tsar uh, and so on. And today, they're a force to be uh, reckoned with. I think I saw Cossacks beating up protesters in Vladivostok on the news uh, during the recent Novalny uh, protests. Um, so uh, let me, that's the end of dry zonias. Uh, how am I doing for time? 10, 15 minutes? Okay. Um, so I want to uh, talk briefly about wet uh, Zomias. And, and here, um, I would, for an American audience, uh, give you a long quote from Henry David Thoreau. Um, Thoreau was uh, a, went to jail in order not to pay uh, the state taxes because of what was called the fugitive slave law. That is to say, groups from the South could, could uh, catch slaves who had run away from the South, and the law permitted them to take them back uh, to the South, and Thoreau refused to pay uh, his taxes and went to jail. Uh, and Thoreau thought that the only safe place to be in New England uh, so that the government could not confiscate your property in lieu of taxes was to dwell in the swamp. Uh, and that, that dwelling in the swamp and moving regularly was the only way to avoid uh, the kind of oppressions that he saw of a state that was indirectly by its taxes uh, uh, was indirectly by its taxes supporting slavery. Uh, he, and I quote him, he says, uh, hope and the future for me are not in lawns and cultivated fields, not in towns and cities, but in the impervious and quaking swamps. The, uh, the original wetland abundance uh, that became a non-state space um, <clears throat> was the alluvium between the Tigris and Euphrates near their estuary. And if we go back 6,000, 7,000 years ago, the water level uh, was much higher than it is today, so uh, that the Persian Gulf uh, intruded up to the doors of Ur and Uruk and uh, Eridu. And this was an area that was heavily populated, it was extremely rich ecologically with many different ecological zones and therefore the kinds of game and fish migrations and bird migrations that made it a rich place to live. And it was uh, therefore uh, quite well populated and uh, you had many sedentary communities, this is before states, sedentary communities of as many as 1,000, 1,500 uh, people doing trade within the uh, alluvium. And what's interesting about this is that uh, in this area, uh, states did not develop until much later. Uh, the reason being that the subsistence was so diverse and across so many food webs that it was an impossible situation for state appropriation to operate uh, successfully. Uh, as soon as they might, ta might tax something, people could move, if you like, to another adjacent zone where there were lots of food resources that were easily available. Uh, later on, 
uh, and I'll mention this later, the Marsh Arabs occupied much of this area. There was a huge break in the dikes at 700 AD. Uh, you can see Saddam Hussein finally drained the marshes underneath the so-called Marsh Arabs. And it was, for uh, more than a thousand years, it was a place to which uh, runaway rebels, criminals, uh, people trying to escape the draft, uh, people who had lost out in factional ba battles. They went to, uh, the, so the Marsh Arabs were themselves, if you like, a scatter zone, a shatter zone of people who were running away at different times for different reasons uh, from the states in the area uh, and who became known over time as the Marsh Arabs. Uh, they were destroyed and are for the most part beggars in uh, Baghdad and Basra uh, after Saddam Hussein finally um, drained, uh, drained the marshes and destroyed their livelihood. Um, here I'm just going to mention in passing, uh, the, gr the, the green area in the middle of this map is something in Burma called the Paguyoma, uh, and it's a, it is a, um, mountain range that uh, goes along near the Irrawaddy River and is at least 300 miles uh, from north to south. Uh, and it is a famous area of banditry and refuge, uh, an area for runaways. And it is a combination of both mountains and swamps. That is to say, at, at when the slope of the mountains meets a flat plain, you get this thing that's called in India the Terai, which is a swampy area at the foot of mountains when the terrain uh, flattens out. And so these are extremely difficult places for the state to control. Until 1975, the communists and Karen rebels uh, had, their, um, had their capital uh, in, uh, in these areas because they were so difficult to get to because of the combination of mountains and of swamps. This shows you it's to, the, to your right of the Irrawaddy River. Uh, it shows you this uh, north to south mountain range. Uh, there are uh, elephants in this mountain range today. Uh, and um, we, I, I walked in this area partly because of its history, and we came to a village that had uh, white things in the trees from a distance that we could not understand. And in some places in America, these would be what we call tent caterpillars that sort of make sort of nests in the trees. But we got closer and we realized that they were mosquito nets and that the whole village was living uh, in the trees. And they were living in the trees because the elephants had come down at night um, and had eaten up all their young banana plants and broken into their sheds and, uh, and, taken, and taken the rice. So this, very close to the centers of Burmese civilization, was a, um, uh, an area that was quite uh, wild. Um, so, um, this uh, is the Great Dismal Swamp uh, on the border of uh, Virginia and North Carolina. Um, and uh, it, at the beginning of the Civil War, the Great Dismal Swamp, swamp held more than 6,000 escaped slaves. So if you couldn't make it to Canada and the North and freedom there, uh, you could live in the swamp. And it is said that many of these escaped slaves had been for several generations in the swamp, uh, had never met white people, uh, and the swamp was so rich as an ecology that you could live there. There were places dry enough where you could plant a crop of maize, uh, and uh, hunting and fishing was uh, extremely uh, abundant. So that and other marshes in the south, like uh, the Everglades and the Okefenokee, were places to which uh, slave runaways uh, and um, Latin American, excuse me, uh, Native Americans also ran away uh, over time, a series of uh, Native American uprisings after they were defeated 
the remnants of these tribes then would retreat to the swamps where they could have a, a life uh, safe from uh, pursuit and being uh, catched, ca caught. The, an abolitionist, uh, black abolitionist James Redpath said, there is a Canada in the southern states. It is the great dismal swamp. No human being, one would think, would voluntarily live there, and yet, from time immemorial, it has been the chosen asylum uh, of hundreds of our race. It has been the earthly heaven of the Negro slave. This is part of the Great Dismal. This is uh, Harriet uh, Beecher Stowe, who you would know from Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, I think, isn't there an Uncle Tom's Cabin in a park in Berlin? Right? Uncle Tom's Hooter. Uh, a less well-known uh, book of hers is called Dread, uh, A Tale of the Great Dismal Swamp, and it's about an escaped uh, slave. Uh, so that at the time, it was understood that swamps and marshes were places, uh, important places of refuge. This is Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, the, uh, the same is true, by the way, for the, this is the estuary of the Yellow River. Um, and the Yellow River has changed its course uh, seven or eight times in the last uh, couple of millennia. Uh, and the next to last time was when Chiang Kai-shek broke the dikes in order to impede the Japanese advance in 1938 um, and in order to send the river uh, south. Uh, this area is then, if you like, a kind of natural wetland. And because the gradient of the plain is so flat, it means that it makes for a meandering river whose course is erratic. The sort of flatter the plain, the more erratic the course uh, of the river. And as it slows down, of course, it, it deposits its sediment that creates its own barrier and it then shoots off to the left uh, and to the right. So this area is incredibly famous in Chinese culture uh, for a zone of bandits uh, and runaways historically. Uh, there's a great Chinese classic called the Water Margin Novel that is about the 105 heroes uh, who are part of this great tale uh, of the water margin novel. And you can, you can buy in China a deck of 100 cards, each of which has one of these heroes uh, depicted uh, on it. It's something extremely popular. Many, many films have been made of uh, the, uh, the water margin novel. This is one of the cards of one of the great heroes uh, of this area. And it becomes a tale of ruined magistrates and people who have been falsely accused and bandits. It has a kind of Robin Hood kind of characteristic to it uh, in which these are people who were, uh, whose careers were destroyed by corrupt officials and, uh, and the tale ends with them being restored to the good graces of the dynasty and to their previous positions. Uh, but it was in the Huai River Delta this was an area for a couple of thousand years that was a non-state place uh, in which the state could not exert its power uh, successfully. And it became known, of course, as a refuge for people uh, who needed to go there in order to escape um, the states. Um, This is, I meant to show that, it's out of order. This is the Marsh Arab uh, area uh, in which a great many of the habitations are, in fact, uh, habitations that are floating habitations uh, in which the reeds 
are replaced uh, every year as the reeds at the bottom begin to deteriorate uh, and disintegrate. So you have, this is, to show you the kind of architecture, this is a completely rebuilt hall of a great chic, uh, and the floor is replaced with another six inches of reeds every year, uh, but it has this magnificence of uh, architecture and design. Uh, it's hard to believe that it's made out of perishable uh, reeds. It's, um, this is what is left of the, uh, the Marsh Arab environment after Saddam Hussein uh, got rid of it. Um, just to mention other marshes, uh, this important in German history, the Pripet Marshes. Um, and, and here it's worth pausing to, to wonder out loud why there are not studies of the history of drainage as a state project. There, for, every, for every study of the history of drainage, there are 100 studies of irrigation. And it seems to me that they have it backwards, that in fact, the job of the state historically has been to take places that are swamps and marshes and make them into valuable agricultural land that can be taxed, to have a loyal population that settles there and uh, is legible uh, to the state. So as a friend of mine who works in India put it, that, that uh, the object of the state is the extermination of mud. That is to say, the, uh, that what the state tries to do is to take mud and turn it either into land, which can be taxed and settled and grown crops and so on, or into water, in which you can have irrigation rates and water rates and so on. These are two, as the French would say, rentable commodities. Uh, and so their job is to exterminate mud and turn it into either land uh, or into water. Uh, and since all these zones of marshes and swamps, including the fens north of Cambridge and so on, have been zones of refuge and danger to which criminals and bandits uh, and dissidents have been able to repair, including religious dissidents historically in the medieval period, uh, these, um, these areas are important to abolish politically quite apart from the effort to create a landscape that is more valuable in terms of the kind of revenue and uh, occupational structure and, and uh, population structure that it can, um, that it can produce. Um, this is the Pripet marshes uh, and you know, um, Von Thunen and especially Chris Thaler and the effort to sort of create a kind of uh, get rid of the Slavic population and create a, a landscape of uh, honest agriculture was part of the Chris Thaler plan for the occupation uh, of the East. This is a picture of the Pripet Marshes in the First World War. Um, and I want to uh, mention as well that um, the mangrove coasts and deltas are also illegible places uh, in which uh, states have found it extremely difficult in order to, to, to control. Um, and that's for the reason, as you can see, if you look at southern Myanmar at the Irrawaddy Delta, you can see that if you want to go east-west, at the tip of the delta, you have to go out one inlet and up the next inlet. So they're like fingers interdigitated. Uh, and uh, even today, there's virtually nothing in the way of transportation that is easy in an east-west form. And so historically, of course, if we're thinking over time, the deltas are growing all the time as more uh, sediment and silt is brought down by the, the river. It might grow as much as a mile or two uh, a year. Uh, and this historically was an area 
that was a runaway place in the pre-colonial period. Uh, the British in Burma spent a tremendous amount of effort, because it is rich soil, uh, draining it and making it into a legible landscape that could produce crops, uh, and it later became the rice basket, so-called, of, of Burma. Uh, this is the Mekong Delta. That's another version of the same uh, problem of transportation uh, and control. So the efforts over time to control deltas uh, and mangrove coasts and so on has been another state project that is actually more difficult than the draining of swamps uh, or of marshes. This is an example of the French lateral canals that are part of their drainage project uh, in order to, if you like, uh, civilize the Mekong Delta. And it was, of course, part of a counterinsurgency strategy uh, because the Viet Cong and the Viet Minh found uh, the Delta to be a landscape that was compatible uh, with hiding and evasion of state forces. This, of course, <laughs> is Venice. Uh, and the whole point about Venice is it, it couldn't be taken from the landward side. Uh, it's too marshy and swampy. It could be taken from the seaward side, but it couldn't be taken from the landward uh, side. One could say the same for parts of Holland. Uh, and so a whole series of important ports historically have depended for their protection, if you like, on swamps and marshes uh, and, and estuaries that are behind them uh, that make them relatively invulnerable from being taken from the side. Um, it, last of all, I want to um, uh, mention something that is um, perhaps un unfamiliar to people who are not Southeast Asianists, uh, and that's to mention the so-called uh, sea gypsies or Orang Laut uh, of Southeast Asia. So uh, there are a very substantial population uh, in the Sunda Shelf, and this is part of uh, the Burma coast, but it's also true for part of uh, Indonesian islands that you have people called the Oran Laut, Ilanu, and other uh, names. And these are linguistically related to people who ran away to the mountains. That is to say, some people, in order to escape states and slavery, Islamic slavery in the, in the, in the Malay world, ran to the hills. Uh, some people, apparently, ran to their boats uh, and became nomadic and are, if you like, hunters and gatherers and foragers in this uh, island system. Uh, and they also are, if you like, a nomadic, uh, evasive subsistence pattern that has allowed them to defy uh, state capture uh, and taxes and so on uh, since the beginning, uh, beginning of time. Um, they have temporary lodging sometimes. Uh, this is some of the boats that they live on. Uh, and this is a t-shirt that people who uh, work on Zomia designed. Um, uh, let, let me stop there, but I, I, uh, the, the point of talking about wet Zomias uh, is that it seems to me to be a complement to the book I wrote on state evasion in the hills of Southeast Asia. Um, and it seems to me that without being a complete geographical determinist, um, although it sounds like that in terms of the uh, description that I've given, that the history of drainage and the effort of the state to control, if you like, wild ecologies and wild geographies in order to make them more amenable to control uh, is an extremely uh, important task for understanding the, the relationship of states to certain geographies uh, of control and the limits of their capacity to engineer uh, those geographies. Thank you very much. <laughs>